Rebecca. Investigators find a clue they think will lead to a killer's front door, but instead find themselves heading down a blind alley. Now their most important evidence is withering before their eyes. When a man reports his wife missing, her abandoned car becomes the biggest clue, but it's the nosy neighbors who drive the investigation. Four months into her marriage, a woman disappears, but when her body turns up, it's clear she was no runaway bride. Investigators must rely on flimsy evidence to bag her killer. For some lovers, marriage can be murder. Even though proving it may pose a challenge, killers can't divorce themselves from the consequences of their broken vows. morning hours of December 28, 1995, Melinda and David McLean let themselves Becky! into the apartment of their sister-in-law, Becky Vargas. The telephone and electricity in her unit hadn't been switched on yet. Rebecca? Becky was separating from her husband and had just rented the Ogden, Utah apartment. Becky? She had told her husband, Stephen Vargas, that she was going to try to start organizing her belongings and would return in an hour or two. But that was several hours ago. Stephen had asked Melinda and David to check on her, since they lived nearby. Melinda, who was Stephen's sister and Becky's best friend, was glad to go. Though they didn't see Becky, all seemed quiet and safe. leaving them unprepared for what they found. Becky Vargas lay dead in the leaves outside the building. Even before the sun was up, the Weber County, Utah Crime Scene Investigation Unit began its day processing the murder scene. The victim's blouse had been pulled up. At first glance, the condition of her clothes made her appear to be the victim of a random sexual homicide. But a closer look revealed the story was not so simple. Criminalist Russ Dean thought the scene might have been staged. It was as if her body had been moved from one location to another. Uh, her arm was under her body as if she'd been dragged. Her coat was removed and was under her body. The leaves were bunched up in certain locations around her arms and legs. And there was no other obvious indication of any type of sexual assault. In fact, though the victim had suffered a head injury, most of the blood had pooled at her feet, suggesting she'd been turned around. Whoever did this had apparently tried to throw off the investigators. The forensics team documented and collected a set of car keys, a cigarette lighter, fragments of blood-spattered leaves, and most significantly, the apparent murder weapon, a broken flashlight stained with blood and entangled with hair. They spent six hours sifting through every inch of the area before they were satisfied. They determined that although the body had been repositioned, the victim hadn't been moved far. The only blood found was just a few inches from where she lay. Because the blood-stained flashlight was the most compelling clue, it was analyzed first at the Utah State Crime Lab in Salt Lake City. Yeah. 
Investigators could see that it had a partial fingerprint on it, stamped in blood. According to latent print examiner Scott Spute, a bloody fingerprint can be even better than a smoking gun. When we have a bloody fingerprint, for example, it's the victim's blood, it's not her finger, it's someone else's finger on the evidence. It's a crucial pinpointing item of evidence in which we can identify someone being at that crime scene, leaving that bloody fingerprint behind at the scene as they left. It would be bad practice to home in on that one print. The lab had to inspect the flashlight for additional prints. The obvious ones and the ones that remained invisible. It required two separate processes. Blood stains, because they're not oily, can flake or rub off. To fix them in place, the flashlight was heated to 100 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. After I heat it on, I then put a, a stain on there, which is called a metal black, which reacts to the blood and makes it very visible and oftentimes brings out areas of blood that were invisible prior to treatment. To develop the latent or unseen prints, the flashlight was exposed to super glue vapor. The adhesive bonds to the moisture on the print, creating a durable shell that exposes and preserves it. Then, a fluorescent dye is applied, which adheres to the super glue. The latent prints shine under ultraviolet light. Testing revealed no other blood-stained prints. The original one, along with the latent prints, would have to do. Once a suspect was isolated, investigators were confident that the bloody fingerprint was all they'd need. While the clues were being scrutinized, Melinda McLean and her husband David went to the police station to give their statements. Melinda told police that she'd been best friends with Becky Vargas for 14 years. And then, and then we went back. Becky had been married to her brother, Stephen Vargas, for nine of them, but it looked like their marriage was coming to an end. As far as she knew, the split was amicable. Though Becky was having an affair that her husband, Stephen Vargas, may have suspected, there didn't seem to be a lot of tension between the couple. In fact, it was Stephen who had called the McLeans to look in on her after the police told him they had no officers available to check on his wife. David McLean, down the hall, told police a similar story. He said that Stephen Vargas had called him just before 11 p.m. the night before the murder. Uh, did Steve at all go over there? Stephen was worried because she was away so long, and the apartment had no lights. He said that he and Melinda stopped by. Though Becky's car was in the driveway, there was no answer. They went to a window to see if everything was okay, but stopped when they heard moaning. They thought that perhaps her boyfriend was there, so they left. They went to a payphone to tell Stephen that everything was fine. They told him what they had heard, then they left. David told police that out of curiosity, they drove back to Becky's a short time later. Now they were surprised to see Stephen Vargas's Jeep parked out front. Soon he appeared from beside the building, got into the vehicle, and drove off. David said that they caught up with him. Stephen was wearing his bathrobe and slippers. He told them he wanted to check on Becky himself, but asked the McLeans not to tell anyone he was there. When David revealed this detail to the police, Melinda reluctantly admitted it was true. Hey, Rob. 
David told police that Stephen called them once more early the following morning. He said that Becky still wasn't home and asked them to check on her again. That's when they found her dead. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined that the lantern found at the scene wasn't the actual murder weapon, but it may have been used to subdue the victim. From the shape of the wound, she was apparently struck down with a hammer or something similar. No such object was located. The killer was clever enough to carry off or remove some of the most incriminating evidence. Authorities hoped he'd left enough behind. At the police station, investigators continued to talk with the McLeans. Their detailed story seemed to pivot on Stephen Vargas. Then it took a more provocative twist when the police dispatcher told Detective David Wheeloth that Vargas was on the phone, but he wasn't calling about his wife. She said that he was on the phone inquiring about his sister and his brother-in-law and if they were in fact at the police station. And I told the dispatcher, yeah, that's who we're, we're in here talking to. And if she would ask him if he would mind coming down to the police station as well. Separation. Police told him about um, Becky's murder and said army. that his in-laws were fine. Yeah, I was aware of but he might not and, be and because Belinda and David She's saw a, him at the murder scene. Loved a lot. I, I, he admitted that he was there that night, just as the McLeans had said. He peeked in the window, but he heard and saw nothing. Because the window was right next to where the victim was found, Wheeloth didn't believe him. If Steve had gone there to look and listen, uh, I don't think it would have been likely that he would have not seen Becky lying just a few feet away. His suspicious behavior and the eyewitness testimony by the McLeans was enough to get a warrant to search Stephen Vargas's Jeep and to collect his fingerprints and a blood sample. Can you, get a, uh, can you get a paper bag? Investigators were after anything that could link him to the crime scene. They found nothing but minuscule fragments of leaves, and not even many of those. Actually, I wish I could find my little The Jeep looked recently vacuumed. They collected what they could then returned the vehicle to Vargas and sent him home. The forensics team hoped they wouldn't need to rely on the leaves. Now that they had Vargas's fingerprint, they could compare it to the ones from the flashlight. Most of the prints did, in fact, match Stephen Vargas. But that made sense. He owned it. So the only one that really mattered was the one stamped in blood. The bloody fingerprint had a shape called a tented arch. Of the three features of fingerprints, loops, arches, and whorls, arches are the least common. And tented arches are rarer still. Only 5% of the population has them. Stephen Vargas was among that group. But the fingerprint on the flashlight wasn't clear enough to make a definitive comparison. Vargas might have left it, and then again, maybe not. I cannot say he did not leave that print behind. I can only say it's not enough to identify it positively. They thought the flashlight would illuminate the killer. Without it, their hopes of solving the case looked considerably more dim. Investigators working to solve the Becky Vargas homicide saw their most promising piece of evidence rendered useless. According to Detective Wheeloth, a case that had looked cut and dried now depended on very fragile clues. After we lost the flashlight, uh, about the last piece of, of physical evidence we had that we could try and do anything with were the leaf fragments that were recovered out of the Jeep. If investigators could find specks of blood on the tiny fragments, they would support the idea that Stephen Vargas was close enough to the body 
to have tracked them into his jeep. It fell to supervising criminalist Pilar Shortsleeve to analyze the minuscule samples. Trying to see blood on a small piece of colorful leaf was difficult. So we used a stereo zoom so we could get down and look very closely at the leaves and then um, to kind of guesstimate if we had any stains and then we would do some preliminary tests. Well, Out of the five samples of leaves, enough? Pilar Shortsleeve found traces of blood on two. But she had no proof the blood was the victim's. She rushed the samples to a DNA lab for analysis, fearing it might already be too late. Whenever um, blood or body fluids are left on soil or, or samples that contain a lot of possible bacteria, the bacteria begin immediately in destroying the sample. Um, they destroy not only the cells, but they get into the DNA and start to break the DNA down. It would take three months for the results to come back from the lab. Investigators had to bide their time, but they didn't do it idly. They had to assume that the results would be negative and began to build their case some other way. Police served a warrant to search Vargas's apartment. They were after the bathrobe and slippers he was seen wearing at the crime scene. If he had beaten his wife to death, surely they'd be blood spattered. Vargas left the clothes in plain sight, easy to find. What are you looking for, Detective? He was supposed to be wearing a bathrobe and a pair of slippers. The bathrobe had been freshly laundered. The slippers had no trace of debris on them. That in itself was strange, considering he admitted walking outdoors in them. It seemed like uh, Stephen Vargas was one step ahead of us on getting rid of any physical evidence that might link him to the crime scene. Uh, it seemed like every step that we thought of to locate that evidence was foiled. Robert? Yeah. But there was one clue he couldn't bury because it was 375 miles away in Cheyenne, Wyoming. After several weeks of wrestling with his conscience, Vargas's half-brother, Robert Esquivel, called police to tell of a favor that Stephen had asked before Becky's murder. Steve had asked him if he would come out here and kill Becky for him. Police set up a phone tap in Esquivel's apartment and had him call Vargas to get him to talk about their previous conversation. Steve had gone through this, this denying or not remembering that part of their conversation, that it had been a joke, and towards the end even got threatening. Though it stopped short of a confession, Vargas had said enough for police to arrest him on January 11, 1996, for the murder of Becky Vargas. But they weren't sure they had enough evidence to convict him. One month later, the results of the DNA test on the blood-spattered leaves found in Stephen Vargas's Jeep came through. A comparison of the DNA from the blood on the leaves matched Becky Vargas's DNA. The blood on the blood fragments matched Rebecca Vargas. Now yes. authorities were confident of a conviction. Where, where are you going? Based on the evidence, police put together a likely scenario. Stephen Vargas, angry with his wife for her infidelity and their upcoming divorce, confronted her at her new apartment. They fought. It escalated. And he hit her with the flashlight, knocking her out. He moved her to the side of the house, thinking she was dead. He was wrong. He wanted someone else to find the body, so he asked the McLeans to check up on her. They mistook her death throes for the throes of passion. When they told Stephen, he returned to finish what he'd begun, using a more lethal weapon. Tiny fragments of leaves told the whole story. 
well, in this case in particular, we had this flashlight that had a possible fingerprint in it, in blood. And that would have been the piece of evidence that kind of closed all the loose ends, but it didn't happen. In this case, it was a very small piece of leaf that was found in a vehicle that had blood on it that came from the victim. And it was just the interesting and exciting part that something so small could be so integral in a case. Stephen Vargas was convicted of first-degree murder and is now serving 20 years to life. The case of Becky Vargas began with the discovery of her body. But when a person just disappears, it's not clear that a crime has even been committed. In this story, the names of the victim and the killer have been changed. On the morning of July 31st, 1987, Dan Remington of San Diego, California, was taking his kids to the YMCA. En route, he noticed his wife's abandoned car on the side of the road. Not wanting to alarm his children, he dropped them off at daycare, then rushed home to call the police. San Diego police dispatched an officer. On his way to Remington's house, he stopped to examine the vehicle. The car apparently had a flat tire. The doors were locked and he could see no spare, nor any sign of 29-year-old Liz Remington. When the officer arrived at the Remington's home, Dan Remington told him that he last saw his wife at 10.30 the previous night when she left for work. After he saw her car at 7.30, he called the hospital where she was a maternity nurse, but she hadn't shown up. Remington admitted that their 12-year marriage was rocky. They were discussing divorce, but hadn't filed the papers yet. Dan handed the officer a key to the car and granted permission to impound it in search of clues. While it was possible that Liz's disappearance could be logically explained, missing persons cases fell under the domain of the homicide unit. They had the skills to collect and preserve every piece of potential evidence found at the scene. Check the spare yet? They found nothing obvious to indicate foul play and towed the car to the police garage. Any overlooked clues would be preserved in case the car required a closer look. Detectives visited a nearby convenience store, thinking that Liz might have gone there after her tire went flat. The clerk told them that she had been in the night before. She needed to break a $20 bill to make a phone call. He didn't know who she called. Police remembered that Dan Remington told them she hadn't called home. It seemed reasonable to believe she may have simply run off with someone else. Liz's sister told police that was inconceivable. She wasn't the kind of woman who run from a failing marriage. No matter how bad things became, she'd never leave her children. Sergeant Dennis Brugos of the San Diego Metro Task Force found that was the consensus. She was very devoted to her children and her family. She helped at school, she helped at Little League, 
and uh, just not the type of woman that would ever walk away from her family. Liz's sister told police it was strange that the spare tire was missing. Dan had changed the oil two weeks earlier and made a point of thoroughly checking the car, including the spare. Investigators took statements from the Remington's neighbors. Many spoke of the deteriorating relationship between Liz and Dan. The information was duly noted, but in terms of evidence that any crime had been committed, investigators had absolutely nothing. At the time of Liz Remington's disappearance, San Diego police were grappling with an apparent serial killer. Because there was no evidence that Remington had left against her will, these more violent crimes took priority. There was no body, there was no weapon, and therefore she was simply one of many missing adults throughout this county. And at that particular time, there was actually a series uh, of sorts that was going on where there was upwards of 40 women who's, who were found murdered uh, in the East County area. So certainly that would have precedent over a missing person. Four years passed since Liz Remington's disappearance. Most of the murdered women were transients or prostitutes, so she was not considered one of the killer's victims. But when a task force was formed to look into the serial killings, her file came up too, and investigators realized she was still missing after all this time. The neighbors taped statements, and the detective reports were dusted off. Well before Liz's disappearance, they had kept a close eye on the Remingtons and helped Liz out whenever they could. Over time, friction between the couple increased and neighbors grew concerned about her and the children. One even kept a log of what went on at the house after Liz disappeared. To demonstrate how the Remington's relationship had deteriorated, a neighbor told investigators about how Dan tried to sell Liz's car without her permission. According to the neighbor, Liz wasn't just surprised, she was furious. A huge fight ensued. He said that the only reason Dan didn't sell the vehicle was because Liz had the only key and wouldn't give it to him. But police recalled that on the day Liz disappeared, Dan had the key to her vehicle in his possession. Police also learned that neighbors had reported seeing Dan Remington filling in a ravine at the back of his property with a bulldozer shortly after Liz's disappearance. They said that after her disappearance, they saw him visit that part of the property every few days. He never ventured back there before she disappeared. Remarkably, because the case had never been officially closed, Liz's car had remained impounded all this time. Dan had sued to get it released, but lost. Technically, it was still considered evidence. Now it would be looked at more thoroughly. One of the first things investigators found were coins in the ashtray. Purportedly, Liz had been last seen by a convenience store clerk when she wanted change to make a phone call. Clerk's statement suggested she was okay. Now investigators weren't so certain since she had ample change in her car. They contacted the clerk to interview him again. That clerk at the convenience store uh, actually said he wasn't real sure that it was her. So that helped us to establish the fact that we didn't really know for sure whether she was there. Suspicions of foul play had been aroused.
Rugos wondered if the flat tire could have been staged. He sent the flattened tire from Liz's car to Goodyear Tire and Rubber in Akron, Ohio. Their lab is designed to evaluate the causes of tire failure. Here. The tire was uh, examined on the rim. Report was the tire was flat, is still flat. There's definitely no Investigators found no outward signs of damage. Only a tiny puncture, which would have led to slow deflation. Once the leak was isolated, Product analysis manager Chester Patterson took the tire off its mount and examined it more thoroughly. From the looks of it, the tire went flat after the car had stopped. We saw no damage on this tire. We saw no reason to have alerted any driver in the vehicle that something was going soft or, or whether the tire was deflating. Because in order to do that, you, the tire is beginning to come apart and you would see that damage on the tire itself, and we saw no such damage. But he did see something he'd never seen in his 35 years experience. The tire removed from Liz Remington's car had been punctured from the inside out. This tire has been punctured from the inside. See these two impressions, circular impressions, right under the punctures of the tire. And we noticed the rust that's contained in them. And it told me that somebody had taken a nail and pounded it through the inside of the tire to cause that circular nail head impressions on the liner itself. He concluded that the tire had definitely been tampered with. Four years after Liz Remington's disappearance, investigators had enough to get a warrant to search Dan Remington's house. They found nothing of significance inside. Outside, a exactly whole different story. In the yard, a police backhoe went to work excavating the filled in ravine. Uh, the backhoe was probably two or three hours into the job when it hooked onto a piece of chain link fence that was lying flat. Uh, the excavation slowed down. What we found underneath that chain link fence was a tire. The tire was the missing tire from Liz's car. And underneath that tire, wrapped in sheets and blankets, was the body of a female. And a missing persons investigation became a murder case. Dan Remington was arrested and taken away. Officially, the body was considered a Jane Doe until a positive ID could be made. A forensic anthropologist determined the remains were those of a Caucasian female who had died of blunt trauma to the head. She had been in her late 20s to early 30s about the same height as Liz Remington. It seemed like they had found what they were looking for, but the law required more proof than that. Forensic dentist Norman Sperber was called in. Everything hinged on the teeth. Teeth are the most durable part of the body, and we fortunately had dental films from her dentist we were able to take films of her teeth because they were in very good condition. By comparing the shape and position of the victim's fillings and teeth with Liz Remington's dental records, Sperber was able to make a positive ID. Liz Remington had been found. Because the victim was discovered wrapped in bed linens, Investigators believe that Dan killed her while she was napping before work. Afterward, he carried the body out to the ravine, buried it in a shallow grave, then rented the earth-moving equipment a short time later, piling on 8 to 12 feet of dirt. 
Then he drove to the scene and replaced the good tire with the one he had flattened. Next morning, he reported his wife missing, confident the police would never piece it together. His unwitting accomplice was a suspected serial killer who demanded all of the police department's resources. But the clues eventually resurfaced, exposing the crime. Though Remington's exact motive will never be known, Authorities believe he couldn't bear the shame of divorce or the fact that he'd lose half of his wealth and property. In October 1992, Dan Remington was found guilty of the first-degree murder of his wife. He was sentenced to life without parole. Remington went to a great deal of trouble to hide his crime. Others take an easier approach which sometimes makes their crimes harder to solve. On September 21st, 1995, a body was discovered in a wooded area in Boise, Idaho. Plastic bags bound with duct tape encased the feet and head. state of decay, it had obviously been there several days. No ID was found. No attempt had been made to conceal the body. It appeared to have been hurriedly dumped there. Because of its position and wrappings, investigators couldn't even determine the victim's gender without disturbing an already disturbing scene. At this point, anything could be a clue, so the body wasn't unwrapped or inspected until it got to the morgue, where it was scrutinized under controlled conditions. Okay. The tape was carefully cut away, and the bags removed and preserved. The victim was female, around 60 years old. The coroner determined that she was strangled. She was most likely killed elsewhere, wrapped up, and transported to the woods where she was found. She fit the description of Wanda Kuzmachev, reported missing six days earlier. Wanda had been reported missing by her second husband, Ben Kuzmachev, when she failed to return from work. The couple had been married just four months. Both had retired from the large firm they worked for. Wanda took a job cleaning offices. You are beautiful. Thank you. Ben, a Russian immigrant who had once been artistic director for the Idaho Ballet, now worked for a security company. After Ben reported her missing, okay, detectives wondered if around. Wanda had had second thoughts about her second marriage and simply run off. But a check of her jewelry and possessions showed she'd taken nothing with her. That's never a good sign. And then her body turned up. The victim's car had not been found, so the bags she was wrapped in became the most important clue. Criminalist Cynthia Hill set to work examining them. It was all she had. Well, in this case, we didn't have a murder weapon. There were no eyewitnesses, and the place where Wanda was found was not the murder scene. So. All these things were playing against us. Hill fumed the bags in superglue to bring out any fingerprints. The glue, contained in foil pouches, vaporizes and bonds to the print, preserving it. The print can then be dusted with powder to make it more visible. Then photographed to create a record. 
Hill found only one print on the bag around the victim's legs, but so far she had no one to compare it with. Ben Kuzmichev was called to the police station to provide a set of prints for comparison. In a murder investigation, it's standard procedure to get a spouse's prints. Usually, it eliminates the spouse as a suspect. In this case, that isn't quite how it worked out. The print on the bag matched Ben's. That didn't necessarily mean he'd had a hand in his wife's murder. If the bag had been taken from the victim's own car, Ben might have handled it prior to its use in the crime. The print was lifted from a portion of the bag where one would normally grab it. In terms of evidence, it wasn't enough. These people are living together. They're touching objects that one another uh, touch. Um, you have to be able to find a fingerprint in a location where they wouldn't normally have touched, or it's in conjunction with another piece of evidence that puts them um, at the scene. Hill still believed that the bags might contain more prints. Though she didn't have the technology to lift them, she knew that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Crime Lab did. If prints were there, the Mounties could find them, or so she hoped. She carefully packed her bags, sent them to Canada, and awaited the results. While Cynthia Hill waited for her prints to come from Canada, investigators in Idaho found Wanda Kuzmachev's car. More than a week had passed since her body was discovered. The vehicle had been abandoned in a store parking lot four miles from where she was found. Police processed the vehicle for fingerprints. They raised two prints from the trunk lid. Their placement suggested they were left by the person closing the trunk. Inside, investigators found something surprising. Nothing at all. For Detective David Smith of the Boise, Idaho Police Department, that was a significant discovery. In talking with the family members, they said that she would always carry her Jehovah Witness literature in the trunk. In fact, they said you could not put anything in her trunk because it was so full. But the trunk wasn't entirely empty. Investigators found a single drop of blood. It belonged to the victim. Whoever had put her in the trunk had also left fingerprints on the gear shift knob. Prints on the trunk and on the gear shift matched Ben Kuzmichev. Investigators faced the same challenges as before. The car belonged to Ben's wife. It stood to reason that he could leave his fingerprints on it. Still, it seemed strange that his were the only clear prints found, especially since he told police that as far as he knew, Wanda was the last person to drive the vehicle. The evidence suggested that Ben drove it last, leaving behind the clearest prints. Tests were conducted to show that in approximately 70% of all cases, the last person who drives the car and, and activates the gear shift lever will destroy the person's prints who drove the car prior to and leave their prints on the gear shift lever. The prints made detectives 70% sure that Ben Kuzmichev was lying. That wasn't good enough. An inspection of the car seat disclosed another clue. I knew Wanda's stature in that she was five foot four and 140 pounds. When I looked at the seat, it appeared to me to be back farther than usual for a woman of that stature to be driving the vehicle. So I placed a female of five foot four, 140 pounds inside the vehicle. She was unable to reach the pedals, which appeared to be a comfortable driving position. Conversely, I put a male matching Ben's description, 5'11", 190 pounds into the driver's seat, and they fit very comfortable. The experiment provided more circumstantial proof that Ben was a liar, but it still didn't prove he was a murderer. 
By now, the Canadian Royal Mounted Police Lab had performed their tests on the trash bag used to wrap the body of Wanda Kuzmichev. The test, called vacuum metal deposition, is a state-of-the-art method for lifting difficult prints from plastic. The bag was placed in a vacuum chamber and then pelted with ions of gold, which cling to the plastic, but not to the oily prints. Then it's exposed to ionized zinc, which clings only to the gold, leaving the prints untouched and in contrast against the plastic. The process revealed a second print on the bag. According to Cynthia Hill, the position of this print was far more incriminating. The second uh, fingerprint that was developed using the vacuum metal deposition proved that he had a direct contact with that bag because the positioning of the hand was in such a way that he would be grabbing the plastic bag, wrapping the tape around Wanda, and he would be the only one that would be leaving the fingerprint in that position at that time. In most cases, that would be enough to win a conviction. But investigators weren't so sure. Proving a spousal murder on fingerprints alone would be a hard sell. The prints and other evidence they'd gathered gave them enough to get a search warrant for the Kuzmichev's home. They found no signs that this was the murder scene. But they did find the Jehovah's Witness literature that the victim's family said she never removed from her car. The items presented more circumstantial evidence that Ben had been involved in the murder. By January 1996, four months after the crime, investigators were still building their case against Ben Kuzmichev. Detective. He began to feel the circle of evidence closing in on him, and he announced he was going back to Russia. At that point, police had no choice but to charge him with Wanda's murder. If he returned to Russia, he'd be a free man beyond U.S. extradition. Though they had enough to arrest him, they weren't certain they had a solid case for murder in the first. Between the time of his arrest and the trial date, investigators continued to gather evidence against Kuzmichev. Under surveillance in jail, he couldn't make a move without authorities knowing about it. We placed monitoring devices on approximately 17 phones inside the jail at the Ada County Jail. Now, that gave us the ability to monitor his conversations as outgoing as well as whoever he was seeing as a visitor. Uh, the end result was that uh, we received nothing uh, that could be used in court. The, nothing incriminating came about the phone calls. But help came from an unlikely source. Kuzmichev had confided details of his crime to his cellmate. The prisoner, disturbed by Kuzmichev's lack of remorse, reported the details to authorities. He had nothing to gain by doing so. Ben and his cellmate were watching TV one evening when the news media broadcast that we had located a witness who had told us that she had, in fact, sold Ben duct tape and trash bags. The inmate told us that Ben found this humorous that he had, in fact, purchased from this lady, but they were not the ones that we were looking for that he used in the crime. The inmate's information, though hearsay, provided one more strike against Ben Kuzmichev. Investigators realized they'd gathered all they were going to get. They weren't sure they had enough. But because Ben was likely to be released and flee to Russia, they had to take the case to trial. From what police could put together, four months after their marriage, Ben and Wanda's honeymoon was over. He had been dependent on her money, but wanted to return to his homeland. She refused to go. Their animosity built, and Ben strangled her. He wrapped her body in plastic bags, emptied the trunk of her car, loaded her in, and dumped her in the woods. Then he abandoned the car in the parking lot. 
Based on the accumulated evidence, Ben Kuzmichev was convicted for the second degree murder of his wife, Wanda, and sentenced to 21 years to life. For Detective David Smith, solving this case meant more than simply delivering justice. You do become personally involved. I mean, this guy has come into to your town, committed this heinous act, and now you have this grieving family that you want to do everything in your power to solve this case for. And that's how I personally take it, and I know any other seasoned uh, homicide detective will tell you the same thing. When spouse kills spouse, the clues are sometimes difficult to read. But the marriage of forensic science with good detective work can bring together what the killer had tried to put asunder. Police find a frozen body in the Arizona desert. The chilling discovery sends investigators searching for more victims. A small town, a brutal murder, and a killer who could be anywhere. When all leads are exhausted, the investigation focuses on a blurry surveillance photo. When a young mother disappears, detectives are left with few clues. But slowly, the evidence begins to point to a dangerous and twisted predator. A lack of clues may cool down a hot investigation, but there's no statute of limitations on murder. Months or even years may pass before forensics can spark a fire under these cold cases. Investigators from the Costa Mesa, California Police Department pulled up to an abandoned car on the Corona Del Mar Freeway. They were responding to a call regarding a missing person, Denise Huber, age 23. No one had seen or heard from her for almost 24 hours. And that wasn't like her. Denise's best friend had found her car on the side of the road while searching for her. Investigators examined it closely, but aside from a flat tire, nothing seemed amiss. The only personal article they found was a pair of pantyhose on the front seat. Denise preferred to drive without them. Though nothing in the car tipped investigators about what had happened, Detective Ron Smith concluded that Denise ran into trouble soon after she had pulled off the road. What struck us as unusual about the scene and concerned us right from the very beginning was that very near to her car, there were emergency call boxes, there were pay phones, there were all-night convenience stores, none of which Denise went to to call her parents or to ask for help. We knew right away that something was amiss, something was wrong. The last person who saw Denise was her date from the night before. She had dropped him off after a concert. Denise never made it home. Bright, popular, just graduated from college, she wasn't the type to worry her parents by going off without a call or note. Her family and friends started to look for her the next morning. After recovering her car, the Costa Mesa police launched a massive search for Denise Huber. 
They notified law enforcement agencies across the country. They followed up every clue, every lead. Denise's friends and family put up posters and appeared on news programs begging for information. As the months and years passed, the tips dried up. But police kept Denise's case open and as active as they could. Every day we would do something with the Denise Huber case. We would review old leads, we'd go over old reports again. We'd look one more time at the photographs. Uh, we never gave up, even though we never really had anything good to work with. After three years, no one could tell her grieving family and friends what had happened to her. Denise Huber had simply vanished. Meanwhile, more than 300 miles away in Arizona's Prescott Valley, authorities were grappling with a mystery of their own. On July 9, 1994, a woman went to buy paint at the home of a man she met at a swap meet. While she waited for him, she noticed a padlock rental truck and the paint and chemical cans cluttering his yard. She thought they looked out of place for such a respectable neighborhood and wondered if any laws were being broken. Suspicious, she called a friend who worked for the police. Her friend thought it sounded like a clandestine drug lab, which police find in the most unlikely spots. He sent investigators from the Yavapai County Sheriff's Department to check it out. The rental truck with the California tags looked like it hadn't been moved in months. The electrical cord snaking out of it and the paint cans all around reinforced the notion that this might be a mobile drug lab. Check of the tag showed the truck had been stolen. Armed with a warrant, police cautiously opened the cargo door. Inside was a freezer. Ready, guys, for opening up. Not knowing what it might contain, they suited up in protective gear. Plastic bags obscured the contents, but at the bottom of the freezer lay a pool of frozen blood. Carefully moving the bags aside, the officers expected to find nothing more than a deer. Instead, Lieutenant Scott Mesher uncovered a horrific mystery. Initially, when we opened the black bags and could tell that we had a human, a frozen body with uh, handcuffs uh, behind the back, ice crystals. Uh, it, it, was, it was grim. The homeowner still hadn't returned, so police ran the license plates on the white pickup, also parked in the driveway. The owner was identified as John Joseph Pamelaro. Within an hour, Pamelaro and his mother pulled up to the house. Sheriff's deputies took Pamelaro into custody, charging him with stealing the rental truck. They were anxious to find out more about the body in the freezer. Mrs. Pamelaro, who lived next door, told detectives that her son was a house painter, which explained the paint cans. She said the truck had been parked there about two months. She didn't know anything about the freezer or its contents, except that the electricity in John's house had been turned off for one day, and he had asked to run a power cord from her house to the truck. At the police station, Famolero was polite but uncooperative. He refused to answer any questions and asked to see his lawyer. Without any assistance from their suspect, 
Investigators would have to rely on physical evidence at the scene to identify the body in the freezer and to find out how it got there. They charged Famalero with homicide. The next day, warrant in hand, investigators entered Famalero's house, hoping to find information about the victim in the freezer. In its frozen condition, they couldn't even discern the victim's gender. Look through these things on the chair. Famalero's house was crammed with his belongings. This was the home of a man who never threw anything away. If clues were here, they'd be difficult to find. After more than two weeks of searching, investigators found several promising clues. The first was a set of handcuff keys that matched the cuffs on the victim. The next clue took investigators by surprise. Two complete Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department uniforms. In the garage, the deputies found two boxes marked Christmas, but there was nothing merry about them. Inside, officers found blood-stained women's clothing and a bloody hammer and nail puller. They also found a pair of women's shoes, the backs badly scuffed, as though the woman who wore them was dragged. And that wasn't all. We did locate numerous female identifications. That included social security cards, I believe some driver's license, and other identification, uh, obviously raising the concern of maybe we had additional victims. Yavapai County Police had to face the very real possibility that John Famolero was a serial killer. Arizona investigators looking into a murder had every reason to believe that there may be more than one victim. To test that theory, investigators brought in cadaver dogs to locate more bodies on John Famolaro's property. The dogs, trained to detect the slightest whiff of decay, alerted their handlers several times. Officers dug up every spot and still found nothing but they never completely gave up the suspicion that the killer had struck before. I just got the paperwork from Costa Mesa. Police, Police followed up on every piece of ID found in the Christmas boxes. Much to their relief, they found that each woman was alive and accounted for, except one from Costa Mesa, California. Her name was Denise Huber. To confirm her ID, Yavapai County forensic technician Mike Winnie lifted a thumbprint from the thawing victim and compared it with the one printed on Denise Huber's California driver's license. The prints matched, identifying Huber as the victim. To authorities in Arizona, the name meant nothing. But to Costa Mesa detective Ron Smith, it was the news he had waited three anxious years to hear. The call I received from Lieutenant Scott Masher from Yavapai County was that he thought maybe he had a body identified as Denise Huber and asked us if we were familiar with Denise Huber. Well, of course, I almost fell out of my chair when he mentioned the name. Now that she had been found, investigators in Arizona had to determine how she had been killed. Working with the frozen and decomposed remains presented a unique set of challenges to Maricopa County Medical Examiner Ann Buholtz. In our environment, to examine a frozen body is very unusual. We deal 99% of the time with people who have been exposed to heat elements, and that is more our area of expertise than someone who has been in a cold environment. 
It took the body approximately two days to thaw where we could actually perform the internal examination. On Friday, July 16, 1994, Yavapai detective Scott Mesher and Costa Mesa detective Ron Smith, along with other officers, gathered in the medical examiner's lab to observe the autopsy. The cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma to the skull, resulting in multiple fractures. To identify the murder weapon, investigators needed to evaluate the entire skull to see where and how the blows had been struck. They called in forensic anthropologist Laura Fulginiti. Reconstructing a person's skull is very similar to doing a jigsaw puzzle. Essentially, you have about 50 pieces and you need to put them back into what you know to be the right composition. It took Fulginetti two days to reconstruct the skull, never losing sight of the fact that this victim was once a person. And I remember standing in this very room thinking to myself, how did you come to be in my sphere? This is not right. It's not natural for you to be here. She determined that the victim had sustained more than 35 blows to the head. The wounds were consistent with the hammer and nail puller pulled from the box in Famolaro's garage. To be certain, the lab ran tests. Technicians were able to establish a DNA profile from the blood residue on the nail puller. It matched the DNA profile taken of the victim's own blood. The match confirmed that they had found the murder weapon. To build their case, investigators had to retrace the events that led from the victim's abandoned car on a California freeway to John Famolaro's freezer in Arizona. It was very important for both agencies, the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office and the Costa Mesa Police Department to work together and piece the evidence from California and Arizona to one case, one solid case, in order to successfully prosecute this. The Costa Mesa Police Department gathered information on Famolaro's activities during the time he lived in California. They learned that he had attended the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department Reserve Academy, but he couldn't make the grade and dropped out after just a few weeks. He kept his uniforms, which police found at his house. Further investigation led detectives to a warehouse in Laguna Hills 12 miles from where Denise Huber's empty car was found. John Famolaro had stored some paint and supplies in the warehouse, then moved everything out when he left the area in August 1992, 13 months after Denise Huber vanished. Investigators thought it was likely that Famolaro had committed the murder here. They hoped to recover forensic evidence that would tie the killer to the crime and determine where the killer's trial would take place. Police searched the unit for evidence of the crime using luminol to expose traces of blood. Applied to a surface and viewed under an alternate light source, luminol reveals blood stains invisible to the naked eye, even traces left years earlier. We found that the warehouse was huge, uh, but I wanted every square inch luminol for blood. Almost the very last bottle in the very last corner that we looked, we sprayed luminol into the corner against the wall. And all of a sudden, the luminol just lit up. This bright glow showed us we found what we were looking for. Technicians compared this blood to a sample taken from the victim in Arizona. They matched. The forensic analysis gave Detective Smith of the Costa Mesa Police the proof he needed to make the case. The forensic science in testing the blood was absolutely critical. Number one, it established that the crime occurred in California, and that established jurisdiction. It also positively identified that blood as Denise. It put Denise at that scene. Pomolero never confessed. The forensic evidence spoke for him. The investigators had successfully matched the blood in the California storage unit 
to the victim in Arizona. And that placed the victim within deadly proximity of John Famolero. Authorities believe that Huber pulled off the road with a flat tire. Spotting his prey, John Famolero approached under the guise of lending a helping hand. He abducted Denise Huber in Costa Mesa, California in the early morning of June 3, 1991. Famolero murdered her sometime later, hid her body in a freezer, trucked it to Arizona, and kept it until police discovered his crime three years later. John Famolero was sentenced to death. He awaits execution on California's death row. Famolero hid his crime by keeping the body close to him. Other killers are not so conniving, but they can be equally elusive. It was a December evening in 1990. Peggy Phillips wondered why her husband, Dean, was taking so long to lock up the launderette they owned in Ozona, Texas. It was just next door, but he'd been gone 20 minutes. She found him lying on the floor, bleeding and barely conscious. Police and paramedics raced to save him. Peggy thought that Dean must have fallen and hit his head. But the paramedics could see that this was no accident. Dean Phillips had been beaten nearly to death. Peggy watched as the paramedics loaded her husband into the ambulance. It was the last time she saw him alive. Dean Phillips died early the next morning, December 26th. The cause of death, blunt force trauma to the head. Investigators determined that Phillips had interrupted a burglary and paid dearly for it. They found only one hard clue, a single fingerprint lifted from a coin box left on the floor. They sent the print to the Texas Department of Public Safety. Like small town police departments all over Texas, the Ozona police depended on the DPS crime lab for forensic services. This time, though, the Department of Public Safety came up empty. The coin box fingerprint didn't match anything they had on file. News of Dean Phillips's death spread through Ozona. Crockett County Chief Deputy Sheriff Alton Davis was determined to catch the criminal who had shattered the quiet of this little town. We've got a population of probably three to 4,000 people, so it's a small town. Uh, everybody knows everybody, and uh, it, was, it was a real shock to the community that something like this could happen in Ozona. The community stepped forward to help the investigation. <laughs> a witness reported seeing two local men wearing bloody clothes the night Phillips was killed. A warrant was obtained and their bloody clothes were confiscated before they had time to launder them. Brought in for questioning, the men claimed they were hunters and that the blood was from a deer they had poached. Investigators were skeptical until they got confirmation from the DPS crime lab. The blood was indeed from a deer. And the men's fingerprints didn't match the one lifted from the coin box at Phillips's laundry. 
the case's first promising tip amounted to nothing. A clerk at a convenience store right off the interstate gave investigators their next lead. Got a couple minutes I can talk to you. A man came in an hour before the murder and asked where the laundrette was. And we're just checking the neighborhood. She described him as stocky with dirty blonde hair and a t-shirt with radio call letters. Yeah. What time was that? He drove a beat up blue van with a green door on the passenger side. Um, there may have been a passenger in the van. Investigators hope to see the suspect on the store's surveillance tape. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Listen, you have a good evening. Thanks a lot. But the security camera was old. The man's face was a blur. Neither the DPS nor the FBI could enhance the image electronically. The investigators were convinced they had their suspect on this tape. But his image like their chances of finding him were dim. How are you doing today? As the investigation into the murder of Dean Phillips continued, witnesses reported seeing a strange blue van in town the night of the murder. Some thought they saw two people in it. Sheriff Alton Davis believed that Phillips' killer was a stranger just passing through town. Ozone is right on Interstate 10, or more or less out in the middle of nowhere. This is the first one we've had where the, someone has came off the interstate and murdered one of our local people. Investigators knew the killer was probably hundreds of miles away by now. And then they got the call. A van matching the one described by the witnesses was stopped about 200 miles west of town. Davis sped to the scene. Uh, we found an old uh, GMC van, light blue, that had a dark passenger door on it, uh, dark primer colored. And we took photographs of the van. Uh, we talked to the, there was a Hispanic male driving it, which didn't fit the description of our, our suspect. The case had run into another dead end. Reviewing the clues they'd gathered so far, investigators realized that all they had to go on was a blurry surveillance tape and a store clerk's okay, fading recollection. They needed some way to turn these hazy clues into solid information. Then they recalled Karen Taylor, an experienced forensic artist with the Special Crimes Service of the Texas DPS. Taylor had worked with the Ozona police on missing persons cases. She is a pioneer in the forensic art and science of facial reconstruction, developing witnesses' vague descriptions into recognizable faces of criminal suspects. My function is to take some bit of information from a crime that occurs, produce some sort of a visual image that can be put out in the media, and hopefully it will trigger uh, additional information that can be used to connect the crime to the victim or connect the crime to the suspect. Ozona police sent Taylor stills taken from the videotape. But after she had evaluated the black and white photos, she wasn't sure she'd be able to help. So I had a look at those stills to see just what I could determine about the face. It was very blurry, the quality was, was pretty poor. So I could see that there wasn't much likelihood we could enhance that video electronically and it would probably boil down to my trying to just do some sort of a, a sketch based on what I could see. Taylor knew that while every feature might not be rendered perfectly, the sketch's resemblance to the suspect would be strong enough to help the investigation. Well, after years of doing this, I've come to believe that the most important thing uh, to capture in a face for a forensic artist to trigger recognition is getting the proportions right. Each of the component parts in a face, each of the features, the eyes, nose, mouth, is important, but it's not as important as the arrangement of those features on a face. Taylor wasn't sure the image had enough information for her to work from. Then she noticed a feature she'd overlooked, the store clerk. She had talked with the suspect face to face. Taylor hoped the clerk might provide the missing details she needed to sharpen the picture. Using the uh, video stills, 
I prepared as much of a drawing as I could, maybe 85 percent uh, done, and then faxed it to the witness, um, got on the phone with her, and she was able to make some changes. She said she wanted me to make the eyes look light, make the lower face look more slim, uh, and I did that. We hung up. I, I spent about 15 minutes making those alterations, and then I refaxed it to her, and she checked it and said, yes, that's right. So I was able to get the benefit of, of her long-distance input over the phone and, and uh, using the fax. Here he was, the most likely suspect in the murder of Dean Phillips. The Crockett County Sheriff's Office prepared a crime bulletin. Karen Taylor's drawing of the suspect's face was circulated across the country and to every radio station where someone might recognize the call letters on the suspect's shirt. Taylor's drawing represented the investigation's last hope. But when all the publicity brought no response, the Dean Phillips murder case came to a dead halt. The beating death of Dean Phillips looked like it was destined to go unsolved. Sheriff Alton Davis and his team had exhausted their last leads. Uh, eventually, the, we'd, we'd ruled everybody out we were getting, and the, the lead stopped coming in, and we didn't have anything to work on. And it just more or less went cold, and we just had to sit until we got some other type of leads. Five years came and went without another clue or lead. But Peggy Phillips was determined to bring her husband's murderer to justice. She contacted a television crime show and asked if they'd run her story. In August 1996, just over five and a half years after Phillips was killed, the TV show aired the story of his murder and featured Karen Taylor's drawing. That's what got the phones ringing. From around the country, viewers called in leads. Texas Ranger Jerry Byrne fielded the calls and directed the investigation. One tip led him to Paul Wesley Taylor, a convict at Utah's minimum security prison in Draper. Ranger Byrne contacted Draper Prison and asked for Taylor's records and a photograph. When he saw it, Byrne felt that at last they had tracked down their suspect. The photograph of Paul Wesley Taylor was, was nearly identical to a composite drawing that a DPS artist had conducted back in 1991. Um, initially, I felt like it was too good to be true. Byrne sent Taylor's records and fingerprint card to the DPS. They matched Taylor's right ring finger with the coin box fingerprint. After years without progress, this was a giant step forward. Investigators went back to the original set of clues, looking for more connections to the suspect. They found out that Taylor's brother worked at a radio station with the call letters seen on Taylor's shirt. They were now certain Paul Wesley Taylor was involved with the murder of Dean Phillips. But they wanted to know about the van's passenger, a witness or possibly an accomplice to Phillips's murder. Taylor's arrest record showed that his girlfriend had been with him at the time of his arrest in Georgia. Georgia authorities located the woman. Her answers filled the remaining gaps in the case against Taylor. She told Ranger Byrne that they had traveled through Texas during December 1990 and that Taylor had pulled up outside of a laundrette and gone in. She saw him fighting, and he returned to the van with blood on his shirt. And she certainly didn't know that anyone had been killed. He never said that he killed She led investigators to a field where Taylor had ditched his bloody clothes, along with a stolen coin box. They now had a credible witness who placed Taylor in the laundrette at the time of the murder. Utah extradited Paul Wesley Taylor back to Texas. On September 15, 1998, nearly eight years after the killing, 
he pled guilty to the capital murder of Dean Phillips. On the 21st, he was sentenced to life in prison. Forensic artist Karen Taylor had turned a single blurry photograph into an image that helped unmask and apprehend a bald-faced killer. When that photograph and drawing were presented, they knew that it was Paul Wesley Taylor. That photograph and that composite drawing is what broke this case open. Investigators speculate that Paul Wesley Taylor got off the interstate in Ozona to get some food and gas. Short of money, Taylor got the idea to knock over the launderette after closing time. Dean Phillips was in the wrong place at the wrong time. In other cases, tragedy stalks its victims. August 16, 1989, Joe Gilbreth finished work and arrived at his home in Villanau, Georgia. He was looking forward to spending the evening with his baby girl, Amber, and his wife, Nikia. He noticed that his wife's car was gone. This was odd. Nikia was usually home fixing supper at this hour. When he went inside, he started to worry. Nikia would never let Amber sit in her pajamas all day. And there was no way she'd ever leave the baby in the house by herself. The doors were unlocked. It didn't look like they had been tampered with. When Nakia's family Nikia. told Joe they hadn't heard from her, he called the police. Nakia. The Walker County Sheriff's Department sent officers to investigate. Joe and his mother-in-law reported three missing items, a blue telephone cord that had been ripped from the wall, a bedspread that had a sheet stitched to one side, and all of Nakia's underwear. Based on what he found in the house, Detective Pat Bedford believed that Nakia Gilbreth's disappearance was more sinister than the simple missing persons case he was originally sent to investigate. My first impressions are, you know, she was taken out of here bound. Uh, somebody forcibly was taking her from this residence. When you tie that into the, the fact that it was realized that a whole drawer full of her undergarments and lingerie was missing, it makes you think that we're dealing with one of the serious crime here. Checked around, see if there's anything missing by chance. Um, took a shower. Joe Gilbreth told the police that the day had started like any other. I checked all the house and that The alarm went off at 5.30. Joe got up and got ready for work. Nakia went back to bed. And by 6 a.m., the house was quiet. Joe and the baby were the last to have seen Nakia. A squad car was stationed at the house in case she might return, but Nakia never came home. On August 18th, 1989, the day after she had disappeared, the Walker County Sheriff's Department had little to go on. We got a tragedy here. We got we got a problem. Um, at first, no good leads to follow up on. Uh, her car had not been located. She had not been located. Uh, didn't appear to have any leads from talking to neighbors and uh, searching the immediate area. Uh, we had nothing at that point. But that soon changed when Nikia's mother found her daughter's car abandoned on a logging road half mile north of the Gilbreth house. Investigators hoped they'd find clues to help locate her. 
Technicians raised fingerprints all over the car, but they belonged to members of the Gilbreth family. Officers found indications of a second car parked next to Nakia's. It was an ominous sign, but the tire impression wasn't distinct enough to photograph or print. Nakia's mother noted that the baby quilt Nakia always kept in the back seat was missing. And that was it. Nothing at the scene offered a clue of what had happened to Nakia or where she might be now. Still, her family held out hope that she'd come back to them unharmed. Though investigators believed she was a victim of foul play, they had no evidence and no suspects. Joe had passed a polygraph indicating that he wasn't involved. All they had were a few missing items and an abandoned car, but still no sign of Nakia. Two days later, a boy collecting empty cans along the highway made a crucial, gruesome discovery. The body was too decomposed for a positive visual ID, though it was a white female about Nakia's size with the clothes and jewelry Joe had described. Dental records confirmed everyone's worst fears. The autopsy determined that Nakia had died from asphyxiation. The examination also revealed marks around her wrists and ankles, marks that could have been made with telephone cord. But there was no other significant forensic evidence. No hairs or fibers, no fingerprints on the body. Nothing that might dictate the investigation's next step. Investigators considered a number of suspects, but none of them panned out. Leads dried up. The case went cold. Uh, unfortunately, we were going nowhere in the case. We had no good leads, no good suspects. Uh, any tips that we got, uh, we did everything from roadblocks, uh, car to car, house to house, door to door searches. Uh, searched the area thoroughly. We weren't able to really locate anything that was helping us. Uh, several months went by and we really weren't making any progress in solving this case. You cannot let something like this go on. Uh, you've got to be able to solve this case. Then, four months after Nakia Gilbreth disappeared, investigators heard about a similar case in nearby Gordon County. A young woman was abducted by an intruder while her child slept. For 14 hours, he forced her to model lingerie for him and assaulted her repeatedly. Then he brought her back home. Before police could identify the woman's assailant, the case took a bizarre turn. The investigation into the death of Nakia Gilbreth had led to a similar account of a woman's abduction. The connection was weak, but it was their only lead. Two days after the assault, the woman's father reported to police that he saw a strange man drop off a Christmas tree at her house. When investigators ran the truck's license plate, they discovered that it was registered to James Ray Ward. He worked for a nearby well drilling company. The woman picked out Ward's picture from a photo lineup. She recalled that during the day she was being held, she told her assailant that she hadn't had a chance to get her child a Christmas tree. Officers took Ward into custody a short time later. Ward pled guilty to rape and was just starting a 20-year prison term. In their check into his whereabouts prior to his arrest, police learned that Ward had drilled a well at the Gilbreths a year earlier. Then he returned to check on it in July 1989, just a month before Nakia was killed. Ward's employer said that drillers were never sent back to check on wells. Ward had acted on his own. 
The similarities between the abduction of his rape victim and the abduction of Nakia Gilbreth provided police with their only lead. When officers searched the home Ward shared with his wife and children, they found a stash of women's undergarments that didn't belong to Ward's wife. Detectives also uncovered a receipt for well drilling made out to the Gilbreths. But it was much more than a receipt. Uh, I had directions, the road name, uh, the mileage that would have led me right to the Gilbreth residence. Uh, the description of the victim he had written in there uh, matched her description, uh, including an age of a uh, daughter that the victim had. Then we had our first direct link from the murder to a suspect. Investigators also found items missing from the Gilbreths' home. A bathing suit bottom, a baby quilt, a bedspread, and a blue telephone cord. Got it. Phone cord. In order to build the strongest case against Ward, investigators needed to prove premeditation they obtained a statement Ward had written regarding the abduction he'd pled guilty to. They wanted to compare this writing sample with the incriminating notes jotted on the Gilbreth's receipt found in his home. Document examiner Karen Scott performed the analysis. A handwriting comparison is basically a side-by-side -side comparison. I look for features in the writing of one set and I see if I find the same thing in the other set. And I'm looking for things like how the letters are on the piece of paper, how they're formed, how they're spaced. Scott looks for the idiosyncrasies, the little details that give a person's handwriting its individual character. For instance, the F in the word fine, it's very uh, short, the very, the very bottom of it. The D in the word road and side are written opposite the way people are taught. Staff first and then the round part. While this is not in and of itself a unique just to this writer, it is not the way it was taught to be done. After comparing the note with Ward's known handwriting, Scott was confident that both documents were written by the same person. Investigators then examined the bedspread, quilt, and bathing suit bottom found in Ward's house. Nikia's mother supplied the matching top, which she found in the Gilbreth's home. Because hundreds of identical bathing suits were manufactured and sold, the prosecution had to prove that the bottom found at Ward's and the top found at the Gilbreth's were parts of the same suit. To make that assessment, the lab had to compare the amount of fiber wear on both parts of the suit. They concluded that the bottom matched the top. The suit belonged to Nakia Gilbreth. The investigation turned to the other two items, the bedspread and the baby quilt. Before she even put them under a microscope, trace evidence technician Terry Santa Maria recognized their significance. I knew that these types of bedspreads did not come commercially from the manufacturer with a sheet sewn to it, so I knew that the item had been altered by somebody. After determining that, I then examined the baby quilt. When I pulled the baby quilt out, I immediately recognized that this was homemade. Santa Maria called Detective Bedford. These two items, the bedspread and the blanket, were absolutely unique, one-of-a-kind items. They were a direct link from the suspect's home back to the victim. This evidence completed the case against James Ray Ward. At Ward's trial, Nikia's mother-in-law testified that she had stitched the sheet onto the bedspread to cover the rough cloth and had sewn the baby quilt for her granddaughter. The only way that they could have come into Ward's possession was if he had gone into the Gilbreth home and Nakia's car and taken them. Ward never confessed, but based on the evidence, 
investigators pieced together a scenario for the murder. On the morning of August 17th, Ward watched Joe Gilbreth leave for work. When he saw it was safe, he entered the Gilbreth home and abducted Nakia. I believe he pulled the telephone wires and the cord away from the wall. I believe he bound her, wrapped her in the quilt, and on the way out the door, I also took a drawer full of her underwear and lingerie as a trophy. Prosecutors called Ward a meticulous, organized stalker with a perverted mind. Investigators speculated that he fantasized that the women he was assaulting liked him. That might explain why he returned to place a Christmas tree at the door of one of his victims' homes. Jurors convicted him of murder, and in July 1991, after deliberating just three hours, he was sentenced to death for murdering Nakia Gilbreth. When the leads disappear and an investigation stalls, that doesn't mean a case is closed. In a homicide, investigators have an arsenal of forensic techniques and all the time in the world to catch the killer. serial killer is delivering death door to door. Detectives move in to stop him before he kills again. Because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Bodies begin turning up in Northern California. Investigators search for a common denominator and find a pattern of uncommon cruelty. For years, a deadly predator has taunted police while snaring victim after victim. With every kill, he grows bolder, while authorities grow more desperate to catch him. Serial killers don't stop on their own. As the body count rises, investigators must use all of their resources to put an end to their murder by numbers. Some of the names in this episode have been changed. January 12, 1990 was another beautiful day in San Diego. But Chris Burns wasn't enjoying it. He was growing concerned over the whereabouts of his fiancée. When his roommates came home, Burns asked if they'd seen Tiffany Schultz, who also shared the apartment. No, I haven't seen her all day. Why? Because her car is downstairs. Her car was in the parking lot, but in the several hours that Burns had been home, she hadn't appeared. The other roommates hadn't seen her either. Then they opened the door to a nightmare. What's going on? Oh, my God. Schultz lay dead, partially disrobed and covered in blood. You guys, call the cops. Get somebody here, all right? Burns stayed with her while his roommates called police. As detectives interviewed Burns and his roommates, San Diego homicide investigators inspected the crime scene. One of the first things they noticed was that the body was posed with outstretched arms and legs. Bruises indicated that the victim had struggled fiercely for her life. 
She had been stabbed multiple times in the chest. There was no sign of sexual assault. The answering machine tape was taken to check for suspicious messages. As the technicians continued working, Chris Burns told detectives his story. Put my hands up under her head like this. To hold they noticed her head his hands so and pants were marked with blood. The situation gave Sergeant Ed Petrick of the San Diego Police Homicide Unit grave doubts about Burns. It seemed very odd to anybody that here would be a fellow that comes home, house is open, his girlfriend's nowhere, nowhere around, but her keys are there, her car's there. Her purse is there, but she's nowhere around. And there's a roommate's door to the bedroom that's closed, which is usually never closed, and he never bothers to, to knock or open it. Burns was taken to the police station for further questioning about his fiancée's murder. Sam. He admitted that he and Schultz were having problems. Let me tell you why I brought you in here. The grisly slaying came at a time when they were supposedly trying to salvage their relationship. Lately, they couldn't get along. Now, Schultz was dead, and Burns looked like the main suspect. The blood on his clothes told police all they needed to know. But Burns claimed that the stain on his shirt came from touching Schultz after he discovered her dead. He believed the blood on his pants was his own from a recent accident on the construction site where he worked. The story seemed too contrived. Chris Burns was arrested and charged with the murder of Tiffany Schultz. I can do that. It's not quite that. Schultz's autopsy revealed she was stabbed nearly 60 times. While researching this brutal homicide case, police learned that the victim was paying her way through college by dancing at a nightclub. The manager confirmed that Schultz's relationship with Burns was tumultuous. She told police that he didn't want her working there. They often came to blows over it. Their last incident had been recent. Transcripts from the answering machine tape contained an apology from Burns for the hard time he gave his fiancée about her job. But police wondered if he'd lost his temper and his control one last time. Only careful forensic analysis of the evidence could determine if Schultz was the victim of Burns's rage. Burns's shirt and pants were sent to the lab to determine whose blood was on them. To better see the blood stains, the genes were turned inside out. When the results were positive, ABO blood typing was performed. The blood on the shirt matched Schultz's AB blood type. But I'm sure we should. But the blood on the pants was type O, Burns's own type. Serologist Larry Turner of the Jackson Police Department Crime Lab performed the analysis. Based on what I found, I was able to determine that the story that Chris Burns had been telling, uh, it was possible that it was true. Uh, the blood on his clothing matched him and not that of uh, Tiffany Schultz. And on his t-shirt where he said he had been down to touch her and possibly gotten some of her blood on the t-shirt, that was correct as well. Burns' story, as odd as it seemed, might be true. Police had no other evidence with which to hold him. He was released, though still considered the prime suspect. But police would soon regret releasing him. On February 16, 1990, one month after Tiffany Schultz was found murdered, police got another call to the same apartment complex. Take a deep breath. Another victim had been found, brutally hey, murdered. Hey, what do you have? We got this one in the kitchen. The partially nude body of Janine Weinhold, a student at San Diego State University, was discovered by her roommate. She had been stabbed several times. 
As in the Schultz case, the killer also posed this body with the legs outstretched. Police feared they were dealing with a serial killer. Uh, there just wasn't any question in, in our minds that it had to be the same suspect. I mean, just the body position, uh, the stab wound clusters in the chest, um, just, just looked like the same murder, basically. Different room. This murder occurred only about 100 yards from the apartment where the first victim was killed. Blood-stained clothes were found on the floor by the bed. The killer left the murder weapon, a carving knife, in the sink. But he left something else even more important. Seminal fluid was found on the bedspread. It provided evidence that the victim had been raped. It also provided police with their best hope for learning the killer's identity. In the lab, Larry Turner tested the evidence. In the early 90s, DNA testing was beyond the scope of most labs. Turner would have to rely on the older and less precise blood typing tests. He found that all of the blood and bodily fluids tested positive for type O. The blood evidence cast further suspicion on Chris Burns, the primary suspect, who had type O blood. Take some of the material. To be certain, Larry Turner analyzed the genetic markers within Burns' blood and in the fluid samples found at the murder scene. Genetic markers are inherited proteins that vary from individual to individual. While people may share some of the same ones, certain markers are more rare and can be used to make an ID. Genetic marker tests are dependable, but not nearly as precise as DNA. Turner found that the genetic markers of the suspect, Chris Burns, didn't match those taken from the second murder scene. That left investigators with two murders and no suspect. They returned to the apartment complex and interviewed female residents to see if they'd seen anyone suspicious. Police feared that these two victims were just the beginning. 3400 Claremont Drive, that's right. Detectives created a list of over 1,000 suspects from the leads they gathered from the victim's friends and acquaintances. About a block away, there's a couple of burglaries. With two murders unsolved, the police were casting a wide net, trying to find their man before he killed again. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. On April 3, 1990, two months after the Weinhold murder, police received an urgent call. A woman had been found brutally stabbed. It's a house and apartment, sir. Sir, you need to calm down for me if you can. Okay, where is the suspect at in this? A witness saw a man with a knife fleeing the scene, his face covered by a T-shirt. Can you tell me, did he have the knife with him? Police rushed to respond. They met Tammy Ho, who returned from the apartment swimming pool and found her friend, Ali Tarr, mortally wounded with a single stab through the heart. Ali Tarr's murder occurred in the same apartment building where the second victim, Janine Weinhold, was killed. Outside, police discovered the knife and the T-shirt held by the killer as he fled the scene. They also found a shoe print left in the mud, which they thought belonged to the suspect. Unfortunately, eyewitnesses couldn't identify him. The girlfriend, uh, Tammy, she basically couldn't give any description at all. Just, it was a male, you know, saw, saw a flash go by. She, she couldn't help in that area. We had a second witness who, uh, at least pin down the race of the suspect uh, as being uh, a black male. The knife and t-shirt were clean of fingerprints or hair samples. After three murders, all investigators knew for sure 
was that the victims were all white females between the ages of 18 and 21, left semi-nude, posed with their legs outstretched and stabbed in the heart. All they knew about the killer was that he might be an African-American. Because the slayings took place in the area of San Diego known as Claremont, the murderer was dubbed the Claremont Killer. A deadly predator, a serial killer, was on the loose. Police looked at their list of more than 1,000 suspects and, from those, re-interviewed all of their African-American suspects again. Hundreds of blood and saliva samples were voluntarily obtained. While the samples were being tested, the killing continued. On May 22, 1990, another woman was murdered in her apartment in mid-city San Diego. The pattern of stab wounds was similar to the previous three murders. The Claremont killer was on the move. Four months later, 43-year-old Pamela Clark and her 18-year-old daughter Amber were found murdered in their San Diego home. Both partially nude bodies bore stab wounds around the heart and were posed like the previous victims. There was no question after the double murder of the Clarks that things really, really got heated up. We had politicians show up at the mobile command post. Um, I had detectives hadn't had a day off in 40 days, uh, which was no problem, you know, they, they just, we had to catch this, this guy. But we were back to square one. Police had a terrifying killer on the loose with few clues and no idea of where he might strike next. Time was against them. Each day he ran free, more women were in danger. The Claremont killer laid low for five months, leaving San Diego investigators with nothing to go on. The trail heated up again on February 3rd, 1991, more than a year after he had made his first kill. Linda Parker, age 23, was about to take a shower when she heard noises at her front door. She looked through the peephole and saw a man trying to slip the lock. Linda Parker fled through her back door. She went to a neighbor's apartment, and together they confronted the would-be intruder. Hey, buddy, what are you doing? Oh, I was trying to get into my friend's apartment. Who mumbled an excuse as he left. Parker's neighbor noted the make and model of the man's car. Meanwhile, Parker called police reporting a possible encounter with the Claremont killer. Parker suspected the man at her door had stalked her from a nearby gym. A previous victim, Pamela Clark, had worked out at the same gym right before her murder. Perhaps this was the killer's current spot for scouting victims. Officers distributed flyers asked people at the gym if they had seen the man or the vehicle that Parker described. The next day, they received a call. Someone had spotted the man on the flyers sitting in his car outside the gym. Police apprehended the suspect. His name was Cleophus Prince. Police had interviewed him months earlier. He had declined to provide a blood sample. What I need to see Police needed a sample if they hoped to compare Prince's DNA to crime scene evidence. To win his consent, they didn't let on that he was a murder suspect. They told him he was arrested for the attempted burglary of Linda Parker's home the prior day. Investigators checked his credit cards. Each had the marks of having been used to slip door locks. 
Prince cooperated and provided a blood sample without detectives having to resort to a warrant. Until the DNA results came back, police didn't have enough evidence to hold him. Prince was released, but he was kept under close surveillance. The blood sample was rushed to testing. If successful, the DNA would provide more solid evidence than genetic markers would. The problem was that in the early 90s, the technology was new, and it could take a year before the results came back. With nothing to hold the suspect, he would be free to kill again. With time running against them, investigators relied on a less comprehensive but faster test that would compare similarities between the sample and the crime scene DNA. If similarities existed, investigators could assume they were on the right track. If the DNA bore no superficial resemblance, they had the wrong man. Within a month, the results came back. The test indicated a match. We just were, I mean, almost in tears. It was just unbelievable emotion involved in, in working with something and dealing with the families and, and all those crime scenes, and, and it was over. Prince was located and arrested. Oh, well. Police were now able to gather more evidence and buy more time to run complete DNA tests. In Prince's possession were two rings that belonged to one of the victims. Police also found shoes with soles that matched the print left at a murder scene. Hey, what's going on, bud? Though police would never know what triggered his homicidal rage, they had a good idea of how his crimes evolved. Having perfected his craft as a burglar, he expanded his repertoire to include assault, rape, and murder. He tracked his victims from the gym and the pool, knowing that soon after they entered their apartments, they would be vulnerable while taking a shower. Prince would then break into their apartments and assault and stab them. Based on evidence gathered at the scenes, Prince was convicted of six murders. He awaits execution at San Quentin. Cleopas Prince actively sought his victims. Other serial killers wait for their prey to come to them. On May 3, 1983, in San Francisco, two 55-gallon barrels were found in Golden Gate Park. Police had been called to the scene by two hikers who reported a foul odor coming from the barrels. Police suspected they might contain human remains. They were wrapped in plastic, their lids sealed with cement, but one was leaking. They were taken to police headquarters where they were x-rayed before they were opened so as not to disturb any evidence inside. The x-rays were sent to Dr. Boyd Stevens, chief medical examiner for the city and county of San Francisco. One of the barrels had two bodies in it, and that was evident by two complete skeletons, including skulls and spinal columns, etc. cetera. Uh, one of the barrels had one body in it. Um, we couldn't tell the sex at that time, but we could see that there were dental fillings, uh, metal material consistent with uh, bullet uh, fragments or jackets as well as identifying personal items like rings or earrings and so forth. Now that they knew human remains were inside the barrels, investigators had to determine how they got there. Technicians took their time looking for any clues the killer might have left. Kenneth Moses, an inspector at the San Francisco Crime Lab, began by examining the exterior of the barrels. He hoped he could find some sort of print on the packaging or the tape. I but getting clean fingerprints off tape can be tricky. More oil. Powder won't work because it sticks to everything. And most fingerprint chemicals dissolve the adhesive, destroying the print. Moses tried an experiment. 
By combining a dark blue dye, an antibiotic, and water, he concocted a dye called crystal violet. He hoped that when the tape was dipped into the solution, the antibiotic would stick to the protein left on a fingerprint, staining it purple. After 14 hours of labor, slowly processing each strip of tape as it came off, we finally got down around 15 or 20 layers of tape to the last layer. Now, no prints were on any of those hundreds of yards of tape. Finally, we peel off the last piece of tape, put it into the crystal violet, and poof, up comes this beautiful fingerprint. A simple magnifying glass revealed another crucial discovery. Presumably, the killer left a clear fingerprint behind in the fresh cement as he sealed one of the barrels. A synthetic polymer was mixed and carefully spread over the print. When it dried, it formed a near-perfect cast, which was then used to make a record of the print on paper. After four days of gathering all they could from the barrel's exteriors, investigators were ready to open them. One yielded the bodies of two nude females who'd been tied together. The women were later identified through their fingerprints as Glenda Wheatley and Paula Rodriguez, two prostitutes. Rodriguez worked for Thomas Michaels, identified as the clothed male victim in the other barrel. Each had been shot in the head. The victims had been ID'd, but the identity of their killer remained a mystery. Police spoke with friends of the victims, but none could shed any light on who could have done this. Investigators also ran the prints, but came up with no matches. Three months after the barrels were found, a man driving on a rural road in California's San Mateo County, just outside of San Francisco, made a similarly gruesome discovery. immediately summoned police. He led them to a bound female body with what looked like a bullet wound to the head. A grim trail of shredded clothing punctuated the horrific scene. Detective Sergeant Robert Morse deduced what it meant. I need for you to go down to the... She had uh, nylon rope extending from uh, both of her ankles, and it appeared as though she had been uh, drugged down the road. Um, and we later measured off the distance, and she had indeed been dragged for 1.9 miles. The entire area was secured, and each bit of evidence carefully noted. A garbage bag was found near the probable starting point of the brutal dragging. The first task after collecting all of the evidence was to identify the victim. Detectives ran a check on her fingerprints. She was identified as Marcia Geary, a prostitute from Oakland, California. Now, police knew her name. The next question was, how did she die? The autopsy revealed that she had been uh, shot in the back of the head, the trajectory going downward approximately 45 degrees. The entrance wound uh, was an oblong shape, which is a little bit unusual. The nylon-coated 38 caliber bullet recovered from the victim was also unusual. It had none of the lands and grooves that a gun barrel usually etches on a slug as it passes through. Police were baffled by what kind of weapon could have fired the fatal shot. The garbage bag from the crime scene was closely examined for fingerprints and other trace evidence. 
The bag was tested with cyanoacrylate, or superglue. When heated, the chemical's fumes attach to the prints, making them visible. A latent footprint was discovered that was much too large to belong to the victim. All investigators needed was a suspect to compare the footprint to. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate that. Police questioned Marcia Geary's friends and family to learn where she'd been and whom she'd met recently. Her father said the last time he saw her, she'd asked him for money. She told him she was trying to find a job and asked him if he would help her get a car. Police also learned from her friends that she was planning to spend the weekend with a man. Thank you. Thank you. For now, his identity go. remained a mystery. Okay. The day after Marcia Geary was found, the body of Catherine Barrett was discovered in a San Francisco cul-de-sac. She'd been tortured and stabbed to death. Her body was wrapped in plastic. metal shavings were retrieved from the wrapping. As police investigated this latest murder, they got a tip from a man named Raleigh Hill, the owner of Marsha Geary's apartment. Hill told police that Geary was planning to see a man named Jack for the weekend. Hill didn't know Jack's last name, but he knew he lived in a warehouse. What'd she tell you about Jack? Just that she was going to see him. Hill said that on two occasions, he dropped Geary off there for dates. Hill gave police the address. It was 20 miles from where Geary's body was found. where Jack lives Yeah, okay. Get there and where it is. All right, take your team members. The warehouse served as the offices of Anthony Electric, an electrical contracting business owned by a former police officer named Anthony John Sully. We've explained that to you already. Better known as Jack. Okay, do you have any other questions about it? No. Okay. Investigators also learned that friends of Catherine Barrett, the most recent victim, told them the day before her body was found that she was going to Anthony Electric. The news sparked their interest. The information gave them enough for a search warrant for the warehouse. They were about to learn the shocking truth about Jack Sully. A homicide investigation led to an electrical contractor's warehouse, where two murdered prostitutes were last reported to have been going. Fort George William Sam, A costumed woman wearing a tutu met police at the door. She led them to a small apartment in the rear of the warehouse. Among the litter of drug paraphernalia, police confronted a disoriented, partially clad Jack Sully. As they explored the room, the bizarre scene became grotesque. While walking into this apartment, uh, one gets the sense that uh, it's almost like a torture chamber. He had a hook up on the ceiling. He had uh, various ropes around. Uh, he had uh, VCR tapes of pornography and sadism. And one would uh, just get the feeling that it was uh, a horrible place. In a preliminary search of the apartment and surrounding warehouse, police found several important pieces of evidence, including a pistol with the barrel removed. It contained nylon-covered bullets, just like the one that killed Marsha Geary. A gun without a barrel might explain the odd oblong shape of the victim's wound, since a bullet shot from it would tend to be unstable and tumble instead of going straight. Jack Sully was arrested and charged with the murder of Marsha Geary. Sheriff, go ahead and bring him this way. 
the warehouse was now a crime scene and subject to a full-blown forensics investigation. We photographed virtually every inch of it. We covered every inch of it. And uh, we're happy that we did because we, we gained a lot of evidence out of it. Among their finds were metal shavings and nylon rope, like those found at the crime scenes. Investigators also found blood, lots of it. The warehouse seemed to be a grim chamber of horrors, an inner sanctum for unspeakable acts of torture and cruelty. With Jack Sully behind bars, police began to ask his acquaintances what they knew about him. They learned he'd bragged about killing three people, putting them in barrels, and dumping them in Golden Gate Park. Now that a suspect was finally in custody, investigators could compare his prints against the ones taken from the barrels of the unsolved triple murder. As soon as he received samples of Sully's prints, Kenneth Moses knew the results. I took a look at the prints, and believe me, I knew those prints by heart. The minute I saw Sully's prints, I knew this was the guy. Sully was charged with the murders of the victims found in Golden Gate Park. Police also obtained his footprints. They compared them to the print lifted from the garbage bag found where Marsha Geary's body had been dragged. The prints matched. In the end, an insurmountable stack of forensics evidence was brought against Jack Sully. Metal shavings found in his warehouse matched shavings found on his second victim's body. The plastic sheeting found around the body of the man sealed in one of the 55-gallon barrels matched sheeting found in Jack Sully's truck. From the investigation, Sully's pattern of violence became clear. Under the influence of free-based cocaine, he would pick up prostitutes. When they arrived at his warehouse, he would subject them to prolonged periods of bondage, beatings, and sexual abuse and ultimately, he murdered them. Forensics linked him to five victims, but other evidence proved he had killed six. On June 3, 1986, Anthony John Sully was convicted of six counts of murder and sentenced to death in California. Serial killers follow no apparent rules except one, to blend in with everyone else. On June 28, 1989, in Riverside, California, two construction workers stopped on the side of the road to eat their lunch. But then they noticed the body of a woman lying at the bottom of an embankment. Officers and forensic technicians from Riverside County Sheriff's Office responded to their call. The victim was dressed in shorts and a man's Western-style shirt. A towel covered her body. She had no identification. The autopsy revealed the woman was strangled to death. A search of the fingerprints file identified her as Tara Biggs, a 28-year-old prostitute. Evidence collected from the crime scene was sent to the California Department of Justice Crime Lab. Investigators found little more than a few assorted fibers. Whoever killed this woman didn't leave much evidence behind. On December 13, 1989, in Riverside, California, another female victim, Pamela Martin, was discovered on a rural road. She appeared to have been killed elsewhere, redressed, and abandoned there. Like the woman found six months earlier, she too was a prostitute. There were other similarities. Police found fibers similar to those found on the first victim. 
they also found tire tracks. Photographs were taken for examination in the lab. The photographs were blown up to actual size. The tread pattern and wear marks would be unique to the killer's vehicle. Criminalists identified two different brands of tires. They determined the killer probably drove a truck or a van with an alignment problem, causing the front tires to wear more quickly than the rear. The similarities between the crime scenes linked the two murders to a single killer. And he wasn't finished yet. In the 16 months following the discovery of the first victim, six more prostitutes were found murdered in and around Riverside. The information on the tires proved invaluable, according to Steve Sikofsky of the California Department of Justice Crime Lab. As subsequent victims were found, we were armed with the information of what kind of tire track we would be looking for, and that would be one of the first things we could see whether or not, in fact, this is another one of the series that was developing. When area police departments met to compare forensic evidence, they realized that along with the tire tracks, the hair and fiber evidence was consistent. Gray and red fibers, gold threads, and bits of rope were found on most of the bodies. These fibers lifted from the victims literally tied the murders together. We were able to determine that, in fact, it looked like we had the same suspect environment from one victim to the next. And really what that meant to the investigation was it looked like we did, in fact, have a serial killer. With each new murder, the killer grew bolder and more sadistic. Police found the body of another prostitute, Laura Mills, in a grove of trees, stabbed and strangled. A peeled and partially eaten grapefruit lay nearby. This odd detail gave police an idea of the kind of monster they were dealing with, according to senior investigator Bob Creed. To where he could just have murdered this person, strangled this person, stabbed this person, and then stood over her and ate a grapefruit. Uh, we, we felt that this told us something about uh, the emotional makeup of this person that we were looking for. Police seemed no closer to finding him. By 1991, 10 prostitutes had been murdered and several had been redressed and left in rural areas. The only clues to the killer's identity were the fibers, hairs, and tire tracks that he left behind. But without suspects, this evidence amounted to nothing. Since the victims were prostitutes and drug users, police questioned women working the red light districts of Riverside and Elsinore. Men known to frequent these areas were investigated as potential suspects. One woman provided a description of a man who had roughed her up. A sketch was made from her description. It was distributed, but no lead surfaced. Investigators hoped to have better luck focusing on the killer's vehicle. The tires left their unique prints on each murder scene and the interior may have provided the fibers found on the victims. If investigators could find his vehicle, they could find the killer. So we let the investigators know to look for a vehicle with certain type tires on it, let them know that they might be looking for a vehicle that had gray interior carpet, they might find some rope fibers, they might also find some other things in the van that had gold fibers in it because we found a, a prevalence of gold type fibers. Maybe some blanket, a sleeping bag along that line because of the type fibers that we found on many of the victims. At an earlier murder scene, police found the tread prints of a popular tennis shoe near the victim. As the spree of murders continued, forensic technicians began to see the same prints. As the tennis shoe's print continued turning up, the tread showed increasing wear. 
Likewise, the tire tracks found at the scenes were changing as individual tires wore unevenly and had to be replaced. In January 1991, detectives from several area agencies met to create a task force. In July, with no end in sight, a behavioral scientist was brought in to study the crimes and create a profile of the killer. Since serial killers rarely kill outside of their race, the profile described a white male between the ages of 35 and 40. The police profile and other news of the serial killings filled the newspapers. It appeared that the suspect himself was following the report, as the next victim was Tracy O'Donnell, who'd been stabbed, strangled, posed, and mutilated. Though she shared these similarities with most of the other victims, one thing made her unique. She was African-American. That he read in the paper that the serial killer stays within their own race, and yet he went out and found this black prostitute and killed her. It seemed like he did that just to show us that we were wrong and that perhaps maybe he selects his victims, uh, that he's in control here. The murderer was maintaining his anonymity, and he was becoming more defiant. By the end of 1991, his victims were being found at the terrifying rate of one per month. 19 dead female prostitutes had been discovered, and there would undoubtedly be more. Investigators in Riverside, California, on the trail of a brutal serial killer, finally got a break on January 9, 1992. An officer patrolling the red light district of Elsinore saw a man speaking to a prostitute from his van. The man drove off, making a right turn without signaling. The officer pulled the van over. The driver's name was William Suff. The officer thought his van fit the description of the vehicle of the suspected serial killer. He noticed the tires were mismatched, and each showed a different wear pattern. William Suff was placed under arrest. His van was impounded at the police station and given a thorough inspection. Police found a gold pillow and a sleeping bag. A blood-stained knife was wedged ominously between the driver's seat and the console. Investigators also found a length of rope consistent with rope fibers found on the victims. While the knife and other evidence from the van went to the lab, investigators obtained a warrant to search Suff's home. There, they found a worn pair of sneakers that matched prints found near several of the earlier victims. Officers also found Western-style shirts, like the one that had been found on the first victim, and a stack of vehicle maintenance receipts. Back at the lab, DNA tests were performed on the knife found in Suff's van. The results matched the blood of the last victim. William Suff's blood, saliva, and other bodily fluids were tested to establish his DNA profile for comparison to fluid evidence found on some of the victims. In many cases, it was a match. Fiber from the gold pillow and sleeping bag, along with samples of Suff's hair, also matched evidence found at the crime scenes. Tire marks from Suff's van were consistent with imprints photographed at several locations. The vehicle maintenance records were also helpful in establishing when Suff had his tires rotated or changed. 
police kept their own records of the tire positions at each crime scene. When they compared Suff's records with their own notes, they found an exact match. Police were able to surmise William Suff's homicidal pattern. He would cruise the red light districts. When he chose a prostitute, he would invite her into his van and drive to a secluded place. He subdued his victims, tying them so he could torture and rape. Then he killed them, either by stabbing or strangulation. Occasionally, he dressed the victims in articles of his own clothing so he could move them without getting blood in his van. He made no effort to hide the remains. On July 19, 1995, William Suff was convicted of multiple murders. He was sentenced to death 12 times. A serial killer's compulsion for murder never stops. Once he finds a pattern that works, he'll stick with it time and again. But the pattern that provides his success also establishes a trail for those who are sworn to track him down.